Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. <coughs> I understand that it was announced on Facebook <coughs> that I would be speaking today, so I'm a little hoarse, uh, <coughs> so you have to excuse me. But thanks for showing up anyway, so I appreciate that. Uh, I thought I'd like to start out what I'm going to speak on with a little joke, but I was told not to, so we'll jump right into it. The subject I, I want to speak on today really is relevant, and uh, we begin by an interesting uh, speech that was given by Theodore Roosevelt. He was the 26th president of the United States, and in 1909, <coughs> after leaving office, uh, he followed with a tour, a hunting tour, because he was quite the outdoorsman. So he went into Central Africa on a hunting uh, trip for big game, and as he concluded that, then he went on a speaking tour. He spoke in places like Cairo and Berlin, Naples, and Oxford. He stopped in Paris on the 23rd of April, and at 3 p.m., Roosevelt delivered a speech called Citizenship in a Republic, which is more commonly known as the man in the, in the arena. Roosevelt said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at his best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. To quote Dr. David Jeremiah, it has been said that the Christian stumbles, picks himself up, stumbles again, all the way to heaven. Today we want to focus on the idea of engagement in the kingdom of God. And the title of today's message is, I Can, I Will, I Did. First we look at the idea that says, I can. When the Spirit of God calls you to a higher level, how do you respond? On the day of his coronation as the very first king of Israel, Saul, who God had chosen through the prophet Samuel, pulled back in 1 Samuel chapter 10. He said, so they asked the Lord, where is he? Meaning Saul, is he among us? And the Lord replied, he is hiding in the baggage. So they found him and brought him out and he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Saul failed to believe and failed to embrace the idea that he could fulfill God's call on his life. Why would a man, a giant of a man amongst his peers, called and anointed to be the king of Israel, pull back. Saul focused on his self-imposed inadequacies, which ultimately disqualified him from being a successful leader. It also eliminated Saul from establishing a dynasty for himself and for his descendants. Now, many people might trace their sense of inadequacy back to their childhood. If you had parents who told you that you're not good enough, if you had parents that told you that you're not capable of succeeding, you can use them as your excuse for the rest of your life. It's your get out of jail free card. That's supposed to be a joke, but it didn't go over well. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? When I think back over my life, I didn't have that. But some people really do have parents that beat them down. I don't know why. Uh, I guess you'd have to have a counseling session to work your way through that one. But the good news is, no matter what your past has said to you, God says something different. God says you can, and he'll supply whatever you need. If we contrast what Saul's response was to that of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, remember, she's a virgin. She's this young teenage girl. And an angel sent by God says, you're going to have a baby, not just any baby. You're going to bring forth the Son of God without ever knowing a man. She could have staggered at that, but she simply said, let it be done unto myself as, as you say. She didn't hesitate and she didn't pause. When promised a baby, Sarah in her old age laughed, and then she lied about laughing. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was old as was his wife, 
He received the message from God that he would be the father of a son who would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And he responded by saying, but this is impossible. I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. So as a reward of his doubt, he was unable to speak until the child was born. When called to bring Israel out of Egypt, Moses started to explain his inadequacies. Remember, Moses had to flee Egypt 40 years before. He killed an Egyptian soldier that was beating one of his fellow Israelis. And so he had to flee for his life. So who knows, there could still have been a most wanted poster back there somewhere in Egypt. But he also had a, 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 a stuttering, stuttering problem that was intentional. <laughs> so you can imagine how difficult it would be to go before the ruler of the largest kingdom in the world and make the demand to set his nation of Israel free. They had been free slave labor for 400 years. That was quite a challenge. But there's something from this we should learn. God does not trouble himself in regard to our inadequacies. In fact, I think he rather enjoys working with people who are inadequate, who gets the glory. God does. When he was called by God to deliver Israel, Gideon responded by telling God, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. What was Gideon saying? I'm inadequate. God called Gideon a mighty man of valor. This was in direct conflict with Gideon's self-assessment. Could it be that we make the same mistake with ourselves? Is there something God's spoken to you about and you think, I can't do it? And in God's view, you're perfectly suited. Are you looking through the lens of what God can accomplish in your life and the lives of those you love? If God is calling you to a higher level, hopefully you do feel inadequate. If God is saying, I want you to accomplish this task, and as best if the task is greater than what you can do within your own strength or with your own resources, it's not our self-image that matters. It's our response that matters. Our faith, the expression of our faith, the way that we respond either gives us sure footing or it doesn't allow us to move onward and upward. And the way that you respond to God's call affects the people around you. Faith is contagious. When you see someone step out in an act of faith, in an act of obedience to God, it will inspire you. You sometimes are the person that is to be the inspiration for someone else. The second point we want to look at is the idea of I will. One of the biggest problems, I believe, that affects individual Christian lives and collectively God's people is when we are unwilling to do what God tells us to do. From the range of the fear of failure to downright stubbornness, we either say no or we just don't go. For many people, the point of disobedience is their refusal to obey God's word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We speak very little about the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but it is it is instrumental, it is vital to our life in Christ, to our life that's pleasing to God. Sometimes warnings come and red flags pop up, but the Christian persists in willful disobedience until a crisis is created, followed by a painful aftermath. Too many of us, too many of us have seen Christians that basically have crashed and burned, and it was preventable. And I'll guarantee you, if they were walking with God, God was telling them, be careful what you're doing. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, I am telling you this so that you will stay away from sin. But I like the fact that God is realistic. He says, But if you sin, there is someone to plead to you, for you, before the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the one who is all that is good and who pleases God completely. So Jesus is tasked with the job of forgiving us, of righting a ship, healing our self-inflicted wounds. Now, don't misunderstand. Jesus loves you. Jesus is keenly interested in your success for eternal life. He has a lot invested in all of us, doesn't he? But wouldn't it be nice if we gave God more to rejoice over than to grieve over? Wouldn't it be great if God could look at the way we live our lives in Christ and smile with a sense of fatherly pride and satisfaction? There's something we need to do that moves past that. Some Christians only repeat the cycle of repentance, mess up, repentance, mess up, you know, and it's just this 
laying again of the repentance from dead works. Well, if that's necessary, it's necessary, but God really does have a higher road for us to walk on. There's a second I will, and that I will is an offer from God to walk the high road with Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 5, and the account is also written in Luke chapter 8, we find the account of the man that was known as a demoniac of Gadarene. He was a man from the city of Gadara, and he lived among the graves. He broke every shackle and every restraint, restraint that had ever been put upon him. He spent day and night tormented, screaming and cutting himself. When the troubled man saw Jesus approaching, and Jesus was coming to that area across the sea, the man ran out to meet him. The demons cried out, actually. <coughs> they begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss, into eternal darkness and torment. So Jesus cast the demon spirits out, and they were identified as legion. You know what legion is? Thousands. That man was possessed by thousands of demonic spirits. The spirits left the man, and they went into a herd of swine. The swine were so tormented, they ran off a cliff and drowned in the sea. Now this is I wrote a little song called, Hey Little Piggy, Are You Feeling Down? <laughs> but certain, certain people took, hid my guitar, so it's a short, it's a, it, but it, deals, it does deal with the price of pork, so just in case you wanted to know. The pigs couldn't bear the torment, and so they did their swine version of Harry Carey off the cliff. When that happened, the man was completely transformed. They must have found some clothes for him because it, it, he sat at Jesus' feet. He was in his right mind. I would imagine if you could look at his expression, you'd think this can't even be the same man. He looks so different. But the people of that area responded in a very, very odd way. They begged Jesus to please leave. Never quite understood that. Now, here was a man who had tormented them, and, and uh, they had to bind him. They, he was an outcast, and now he's in his right mind. So I don't know if they were afraid of Jesus or if they realized that they were going to be paying more for pork chops and sausage. But whatever it was, they wanted him to leave. And he went there to, to minister. Darkness today is preferred over light by a lot of people. You, can't, you ever scratch your head and wonder what's going on in the world and society and think, what are these people thinking? It's hard to comprehend, but there are many people, and I'm afraid it is a majority of people, who prefer darkness over light. If you come to the light, it's going to expose your darkness, and you have the choice. Do you run away from the light, or do you change? Do you, do you allow Christ to work in your life? We pick up the story in Mark chapter 8, verse 18. So he, meaning Jesus, got back into the boat. The man who had been possessed by the demons begged Jesus to let him go along. But listen to this, but Jesus said, no. Go home to your friends, he told them, and tell them what wonderful things God has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to tell everyone about the great things Jesus had done for him, and they were awestruck by his story. The man wanted to do a good thing. He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to continue to be in Christ's company. He wanted to eat with him, to live with him, and listen to his words. This was a man who had set him free from unimaginable torment. It would be hard for us to understand what that man experienced, the deliverance. Now he was in his right mind, and there before him stood the, the very Son of God, face to face. But Jesus said no. Jesus had a different direction for his life. Jesus said no. It's been said that God has one of three answers to every prayer that you and I present. Either yes, no, or wait. How do you respond to no? Have any of you had any no's recently? Sometimes we're troubled by that. Now, don't misunderstand. The promises of God are yea and amen. In other words, that means yes, 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 yes. But when you ask God for something, he may say no. Accepting a no requires a lot of maturity, and it really requires you to have complete trust in your Father's goodness. It's an example of the benefit of childlike faith. 
The man that was delivered was assigned the task of returning to the very community that he had once terrorized, from which he was banned, and he was commanded to tell the people what Christ had done for him. Never underestimate the power of your personal testimony. People like to hear a story. That's how Jesus communicated much of the time. You have a story. It's unique to you. How did you find Christ? How did, how did that happen? What happened in your life? What's happened since? What's God doing now? People want to hear that. And for this man, can you imagine? When they heard that, you know, this man that was possessed by demons was coming to their town, everybody knew his name. Everybody knew his story. You couldn't have kept people away. I mean, it would have been the biggest draw that you could ever imagine. And how did the people respond? The Bible says that they all marveled. They were amazed to hear his testimony. And it's strange that these people that begged Jesus to leave, that God worked around that and sent the very man that had been delivered to carry forth the message of the word of God, the power of Christ. The depths and the riches of the wisdom of God are past our comprehension. So consider this. Is God calling you to go where you don't want to go? What if Jesus is telling you to do what is not on your list? Will you do it? Will you say, I will? Will you allow God to shift the direction of your life? Well, I can't. I'm too young. That's impossible. I just got married. That's impossible. I have turmoil in my life. I can't do that. I'm too old. That's my new excuse. Too old. Works pretty well, except God knows better, right? I don't have the right skill set for that. As we mentioned earlier, Moses had a stuttering problem, yet God sent him to be the messenger to Pharaoh. Paul was a persecutor of a church, and yet he became the greatest apostle of all time. Timothy lacked self-confidence, but yet he faithfully helped Paul establish and govern churches. Not every assignment is going to be comfortable. Sometimes I think it's a false sense of humility if we defer, if we start listing our inadequacies. Some people just want to find a way for an easy back door to escape the call. But there's something else that has escaped our grasp, and I think we need to look a little bit deeper. What if the thing that God is telling you to do is the thing that will enable us to properly run our race and more significantly to truly finish our course? The Apostle Paul made a statement that few believers will be able to say. He wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, hopefully, all of us will be able to say that we have fought a good fight. Living the Christian life is a fight, is it not? It is a struggle. Are we going to keep the faith? We better, right? That's essential. Jesus was kind of speaking out loud when we're thinking out loud when he said, you know, will the son of man find faith on the earth when he returns? It's vital that we keep the faith. But how many will be able to say, I've finished my course? Only at the judgment seat of Christ will the entire picture of our lives be presented. All of the what ifs will be answered, in particular, those times that God spoke and it become very clear whether we obeyed or failed to listen how many Christian lives will prove to be incomplete, falling short of God's comprehensive design? How sad this story would have been if the man that was delivered from the demon spirits would not have done what Jesus said. But he did. He said, I can and I will. There was another man, a young, very successful man that we know as the rich young ruler, his encounter with Christ, much like the demoniac Gadarene, was not by chance. He, too, came to Jesus on his own volition. He craved the answer to the greatest question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If you're not familiar with the account, Jesus put forth the essentials of a relationship between God and man. And the young man responded by saying, I have obeyed these things ever since I was a youth. And the word of God tells us that Jesus looked at him and loved him. He was being honest. But then Jesus offered to him something that was rare. He said, if you want to be perfect, sell all that you have, 
Give your riches to the poor and come follow me. The demoniac of Gadarene wanted to follow Jesus, but wasn't offered. Here's a man that Christ makes that offer to. The young man was obviously of sound moral and integrity, but he walked away, the Bible said, sad because he had very much wealth. The story really isn't about money. It's about the condition of a man's heart. The young man didn't own possessions. Possessions owned him. I believe that if he had made the decision to take up the offer that Jesus presented to him, that today we would know his name and we would know his story. I think it would have been recorded, but we'll never know because he didn't go. It may seem counterintuitive, but often God's high road is a path filled with pain and is laden with suffering. That message may not be popular and definitely won't sell many books or bring very many speaking engagements, but it's true in biblical accounts and it's true in Christian history. God's call to the high road is filled with grit and is filled with reality. That fact is missing from much of the Christian message today. Here's something I want you to think about. Is it possible that the absence of the demand and cost of discipleship is actually turning many people away today from following Christ? We have been called to make disciples, not to make people comfortable. Human beings have an innate need to submit, to yield, and to serve. And it's only through Christ, who is a faithful master, where that's safe and healthy. There are two callings for every person. The first is a call to repentance and salvation for all who have fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned. And so through Christ's suffering on the cross, we are able to be acceptable in the Christ of God, in, in, in God's presence. Jesus paid the price. We simply have to believe him and receive him into our hearts. The second call is partially embedded within the first, and that's the call to follow. That's part of the completion, but there's often a subsequent step, and that's what I'm talking about, the higher road that God offers to us. Not every believer during Christ's earthly ministry was called to be one of the 12. Even amongst the 12, not all 12 were called to be one of the three. When a high road is offered, there is a decision that has to be made, and that decision will carry eternal consequence. Two men we spoke about, one beginning with nothing, that laid up treasure in heaven. Another man, possibly born into wealth, who allowed temporal riches to rob him of eternal gain. Oddly enough, think of this. Both men needed to be delivered from something. We've discussed several subjects today, one of which is that hearing God say no is not a bad thing. Letting go when God tells you to do so is not loss. It is freeing and it is often necessary for you to be complete. John 9, 4, Jesus said, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. There will soon come a time when the opportunity for you to labor for the kingdom of God will end. We'll all come to our cutoff point. It'll be like somebody will say, time's up. So if God is speaking to you about making a change in your life, Whatever you do, don't say I can't. God would not call you to something if he didn't know that you can accomplish it. You say it's a stretch. That's good. You say I don't have everything I need. I know somebody that does. Amen? Don't say I won't. If you say I won't, you're really diminishing your life. And probably worse than that, if we aren't careful, we can rob the kingdom of God of its power and effectiveness. God needs you. He wants you to be engaged. Remember, in Christ, you can. In submission, you say, I will. And someday, when you stand before your Savior at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll be able to say with certainty, I ran my race, I've kept the faith, and I've finished my course. You'll be able to say, I did. Amen. The worship team is going to come and close out our service with a song as they're coming. Let's bow our heads in, in, in prayer, please. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord God. We thank you for the high calling that we find in Christ Jesus. And Father, we pray, God, that the words of this message, message will penetrate our hearts, God. If there's people here today that 
you're speaking to about maybe a change, a subtle change, or maybe a significant change in their life. We pray that they will know that they can do it. And we pray that they'll surrender, Lord, and all of us will surrender our will to you. Because ultimately, Lord, it is for your glory that we ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen.